scripture reading for today is in the Gospel of Luke, Gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And I will start in verse 20. Luke 6, 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Thus far the reading of the Lord's word, let us pray. Lord God, your words to us are often uh, hard, and they are often the exact opposite of how we would have ourselves to be. Uh, Lord, as we hear your words, uh, we pray that they would be your words that we hear, uh, not mine and not the thoughts of our hearts, but that they would be your words, that you would truly speak to us through your word, and that you would conform us more and more to the image of Christ. These things we ask in his glorious name. Amen. One of the more frustrating parts of being a parent or a teacher or a leader of any sort is when people under our care won't trust us. As a teacher, I'm always telling my students how to succeed. Do the homework. Actually do the homework. Come to class. Stay awake. Every now and then, some of them will take my advice and then they act surprised that my advice is helpful. I did the homework and I did better on the test. Of course. If they trusted me from the beginning, they would have done what I said from the beginning and they would have had better success right away. As parents, we're telling our kids how to improve their lives. Actually brush your teeth. Actually get out of bed if you want more time for fun. Actually clean your room if you want to find the things that you own. Every now and then our kids do what, they, do what we say and they seem surprised that they get the benefits. If only they had trusted us right away, they would have done better all along. Well, we are just like our students, and we are just like our children. Uh, in this passage, Jesus is telling the same things for us. He's, he's telling us how to succeed and get benefits, how best to live and receive what he calls great rewards. But how seldom we do these things. Every now and then we, we do them, and we seem surprised that when we follow the Lord, we receive the benefits that he promises. If only we trusted Jesus more from the beginning, we would do what he says, and we would have better success right away. So I mentioned trust as the way that I'm thinking about this passage, but we don't see Jesus talking explicitly about trust here. So why am I saying that I think this, this passage has an element of trust in it? It's because I believe that a lack of trust is one of the primary reasons that we don't obey him and we don't receive his rewards and we don't avoid his threats. So why do I say it's about trust? The rewards and threats that Jesus mentions are unseen and they're off in the future. They're things that we don't have in front of us to our available to our senses. But the suffering that he tells us to, to be willing to take is here and now. The poor are poor now. The kingdom of God is eternal. The hungry are hungry now. Satisfaction is off in the future. Weeping is now. Rejoicing is off in the future. Being reviled and excluded and humiliated is now, 
the heavenly reward of the affirmation of our firstborn brother, Jesus Christ, is off in the future. And for those of us who've been relatively rich, full, well-spoken of, laughing, very comfortable in this world, we're far too often afraid to give these up now because we don't often trust that the woes that are coming in the future are worse than losing our comforts now. So just like that student who doesn't want to give up a few hours of video gaming today to do homework, <laughs> to have better learning and success and uh, better career outcomes, just like the child who doesn't want to clean her room now so she can find her clothes and her hairbrush and whatever else she needs later. Um, we don't want to endure poverty and hunger and weeping and exclusion now to hope that we receive kingdom, satisfaction, laughter, and the presence of Christ later. Our children and our students don't trust us that short-term pain leads to long-term gain. And I think far too often we don't trust Jesus for the same. I also see this when he talks about how we ought to love our neighbors. He, he chastises us for only loving when we expect to receive something back, something that we can see and have right away. He tells us that we receive no reward, no credit, no benefit when we get something back, which sounds ridiculous. It sounds like Jesus doesn't understand economics. He doesn't understand exchange and investment and profit. I, I do something good for you now, and then you do something good for me back in return. It's, that's mutually beneficial exchange. That's the, the foundation of, of economic systems. It's, it's like Jesus has never read Adam Smith. He's never read The Wealth of Nations and taken Econ 101. <laughs> But of course, Jesus does understand exchange. Uh, he completely understands exchange, but he also completely devalues the things that we receive through earthly exchanges. He says that when we value the earthly goods, we can see here and now, that we can hold in our hands and we can experience now. When we value those things, the things we can receive from another, then we have nothing that's truly of value. The true rewards come from the kingdom of heaven. And they come mostly not in what we get, but in what we become. <clears throat> if you look at verses 35 and 36, he offers this, this promise, which has really been uh, in my heart and on my mind um, for the last few months or so. He says, love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. Mm -hmm. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. <clears throat> what he offers us, when we give ourselves away and get nothing back on earth, this, this heavenly kingdom reward is to be like our Father, to be sons of the Most High, will be like him who is merciful even to the wicked and ungrateful. Is that it? Is that all? I get to be like my Father in heaven? I give up a lifetime of riches and acceptance and satisfaction of glory and everything I see on earth, and then I get poverty and hunger and weeping and reviling to be what? To be a son of God? This is why I say we have to trust Jesus. We have to trust Jesus that being a son of God, being like our Father in heaven, is better than everything we will give up to receive that. We have to trust him that it will happen and that it will be, will be better for us than what we give up. He does understand exchange. Jesus understands exchange perfectly. He, he acted for his own reward and motivation. The Bible says he went, to the cross, he went to the cross for the reward of the joy set before him. He acted for the reward of a bride and a kingdom of people uh, to be glorified by his Father in heaven. He knows that rewards are motivating. He was motivated in part by rewards. He made us that way and he's like us in that way. So he offers us the greatest reward he can offer. He offers us back what we've lost in the fall. And what he came to give back to us, conformity to the image of God. This is why I think Paul says in Romans 8 that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed. So things we suffer now are not worth comparing to the glory of becoming like Christ. He says even the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Jesus says we'll be like the sons of God. Paul says the creation waits for us to be revealed as the sons of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When the children of God appear, again, the entire creation is redeemed. For we know the whole creation has been growing together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly 
as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. Again, this theme of becoming sons of God, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We trust Christ for the things we do not see. We wait for it with patience, and we become sons of God. Paul says, like Jesus says, we have to hope and trust in Christ. And this is really the biblical definition of faith, the assurance of things unseen. He goes on to say, Paul goes on to say that those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. We'll be like our Father in heaven, we'll be conformed to the, his son, who is the image of the Father, will be like Jesus, the firstborn among many brothers. So Jesus tells us how it is to achieve this great reward. He tells us to trust him, to give up on earthly things and seek the things above. Be willing to give up our riches and our social standing and our rights and everything that's held in esteem and valued in this world and receive what is much, much better. We can only do this. We will only do this if we trust him that he will do what he says and that what he says is better for us than what we see. And if we do that, we will become sons of God and have the greatest reward in the kingdom to be like our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Lord Jesus.